All right, so, so Connected Careers, um, why did I choose this and, and where are we going here? Uh, from this picture, you know, we, there's a lot of ones and zeros. Uh, for those that uh, know me, uh, I, I've been recruiting in the tech space for the last, uh, gosh, I guess 10 years. Um, and that was a very, um, a very proactive move I've made to move into this space. Um, and, you know, why do I want to talk about this topic um, called the power of the network? Um, I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer uh, that we are only as good as the people that we surround ourselves with. And if we build out our network, I know Sean last week, if you heard last week, Sean talked a little bit about LinkedIn and content and, and kind of creating connections through LinkedIn, et cetera, which, which is good. We're going to take that a step further and talk just about the power of the network and how do we, how do we leverage that? You know, what is, what is this like, you know, degrees of connections? I know Sean talked a little bit about that last week. But what's really important to me is when we talk about connected careers, how, how are our careers and jobs connected? Kind of what's the lineage, when we think about lineage uh, for either a family tree or when we talk about Jesus, what's the lineage for our careers? What does that look like? Um, and as you walk through that either backwards, as you walk through that backwards, you can start to really um, tie in very specific pieces or choices or decisions that have led you to where you are today. And it's all, it's all connected, right? Um, when we think about how we are connected, uh, you know, we, we go upstairs, God created the world and created everybody in the world. Um, so in some fashion, we're already connected. Um, but how do, how do we kind of tie that into uh, the power of the network and how our careers are connected? So really the goal is to build, you know, building a network that will advance your career and life. Every, every step along the way, uh, you know, you should be thinking about that. How, how was I helped by somebody and how can I help somebody? I've been a recruiter for 20 years. I've worked for big and small companies. I've worked internally and externally. And one of the things that keeps me in my job or in this career is that I get to change people's lives. Um, and, and either directly or indirectly. In this case, tonight, it's an indirect and maybe an indirect uh, relationship. But in many cases, whether it's hiring folks for the company I work for, or um, putting people to work when I worked in the agency, the recruiting agency space or working for a recruiting company, um, I had the ability to either uh, change somebody's lives for the better or really make their lives miserable. So how do we build a network to advance our career and our lives? First, I'd like to start just by what is, what is being connected? Um, when we think about the um, connections, you know, I, I looked at this definition from a wire, when we think about like a wire and a light perspective, to be connected to get electricity, you have to be plugged into the wall. You have to be connected into a power source that gives energy that turns on, that allows you to turn on the light bulb. If there's no power source there, there's no connection there. You don't have any light. All you have is darkness, unless it's daytime out. So being connected is, is having a, a connection point. And in this, in this world of network, when we think about networking, um, we think about you know LinkedIn. It's the first, second, third degree connections. We're going to talk a little bit later about the six degrees. Uh, we, we all know Facebook. Um, there's all these ways from a social media perspective that we are now connected. It's not a physical connection, but when now we have this social connection, uh, this tie, this, this common thread that connect us. For each person in me, being connected might be different. And you just have to choose 
and you have to look at how you are connected to this person. But at the, at the, the root of it all, uh, we each go into our connections um, with, a, with a common, you know, we choose how we're going to go into our connections, how we are going to be connected, how are we going to treat each other. So the next, next part of, uh, and th this is kind of what we'll cover through the, the topic today. We're going to talk about what's being connected. We covered that. The who and the why. We'll dig into um, who should be involved and why should they be involved. And then where do you find them? We already, again, last, year, last week, Sean talked a little bit about or talked about LinkedIn. We all know there's plenty of other social media platforms. We know the people are out there. But where do we go to find them? And then once we find our connections or the folks we want to be connected to, what do we do once you find them? What's the step? So we'll cover, we'll cover those four areas, hopefully, as we, uh, as we get finished. All right, so we're going to have a, uh, I wanted to make this a bit inter interactive. So hopefully you're watching the screen. Um, what I would like for us to do is the, the, there's dates on the left hand side here and then the, there's obviously numbers and numbers um, equal uh, people, if you will, um, or, or kind of the, the degrees of separation. What I'd like you to do is just uh, maybe somebody can shout out. Um, in 1929, how many degrees of separation do you think there was out of, the, out of this list? Anybody? Seven. Seven. That's a very good guess, David. Why'd you choose seven? Because it was the highest number. Very good. And technology... You know, we were a little more scattered out. Of course, I wasn't around in 1929. But <laughs> neither, neither was rumor, I. Rumor has it that uh, things were a little difficult to communicate back then. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, so the first, uh, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the idea, um, uh, well, actually, before I give out the answers, let's, let's go through the rest of them. So that was in 1929. In 2008, what do you think the number was? Anybody have a guess? And this 5.28. 5 5.28, correct. And these are kind of the, the degrees of people uh, that you're, you know, when we think about degrees of separation or degrees of connection, these are the number of folks um, that you're really, how many people you're really connected or, or removed from to make that connection. So 2008, we have 5.28. What about 2011? Four point seven four. All right, and that would leave us in two thousand sixteen to be three point five seven. And you guys are right. So in nineteen twenty nine, six degrees of separation. Has anybody ever heard that term? Six degrees of separation was actually coined uh, that everyone in the world is linked by about seven relationships or six to seven relationships. So every six to seven people, we were, we were linked somehow. And we see, this on, uh, we see this on Facebook every day. As you can see there, Mark, Mark's in there speaking about how people are likes and the lines of how they're connected all in. Whether it's an exchange with an old friend that brings a smile to your face or a new connection that changes your life path, or even the world, uh, you are connected in some fashion. And obviously, we all know that when we're connected, powerful things happen and lives are changed. And at this point, and I think this was back in 2016, it means that each person in the world, at least among the 1.59 billion active on Facebook, is connected to every other person by an average of three and a half other people. And actually, Facebook did a, a 
complete study of all their folks to come up with this data. Uh, the 1.5 billion, they looked, at, they looked at all of the data to, to figure out that as time went on in 2016, it was 3.57. Five years before that, it was 4.74. I can only just imagine in 2020, I'm sure it's uh, maybe not with COVID, or maybe so, maybe the social trend that we're in right now has, has uh, decreased that number even more. So has anybody heard about uh, the Kevin Bacon game? So they actually, uh, on the six degrees of separation, they actually came up with a game called, um, uh, it's a parlor game. And it's uh, based on the six degrees of separation. It's called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon or Bacon's Law. And the concept uh, is that any two people on earth are six or fewer acquaintance links apart. Movie buffs challenge each other to find the shortest path between an arbitrary actor and a prolific actor, Kevin Bacon. It rests on the assumption that anyone involved in the Hollywood film industry can be linked through their film roles to Bacon within six steps. So, and obviously I just thought it was kind of funny in here that even, you know, Kevin Bacon is the center of this uh, connection point to all of these people and all these actors through six, six different steps would be tied into uh, a movie that Kevin Bacon was in. Kind of just made me laugh. So that talks about like us, right? If, if we think about the person we want to work for, the company we want to work for, how are we then connected if we kind of look at those numbers that I just showed up on the screen? I, li I really like this book. It's called Networking is a Contact Sport. And Joe Sweeney is the author, author, and he states in his quotes in his book, sometimes you get pushed aside or knocked down, but if you persevere, remain focused, and look for ways to engage people, ways that are fresh, clever, and persistent, networking will make things happen and take you wh where you want to go in your life. And it's interesting. Sweeney would talk to a number of folks, did a bunch of study in his book, and in one of his conversations with a gentleman by the name of Joe Polish, uh, Joe Polish was an agate. And as Joe talked to, as Joe Sweeney talked to Joe Polish um, about the networking as a contact sport, he was looking for kind of what the definition of addiction was. And Joe Polish said the, the definition of addiction is the opposite of addiction is connection. Joe Polish said, it's about a deeper connection with ourselves, with our, with others, and to a power higher and greater than ourselves. So, so with that being said, when we think about connections, how do we connect deeper and more meaningful with others? The quality of our lives are based on the quality of our relationships. So when we think about a connection, how are we going after that connection? What does that connection mean to us? Is it a superficial connection or is there some depth in meaning to that connection? I, and I, I don't have it on this slide, but I will say that, you know, I have over, I mean, I have over 3000 connections or 2,800 to 3000 connections on LinkedIn. And it says within three degrees, I'm connected to, I think, 1.5 or 2 million people. But I think to myself, if I have 3,000 people I'm connected to, how deep can I really get with 3,000 people? Have you ever thought about that? I have. And what comes out of that thought? Well, you know, I think you can't really be the same level of connection. So you need to think about, you know, how I, I think about in scripture, you know, Jesus had, you know, everybody that he's connected to in some way. Right. 
hundreds and hundreds of disciples, right? Then he had the 12, then he had three that were kind of a smaller group, and then he had one-on-one -on -one contacts with people. So, you know, you, you can't, you can't really be connected to thousands of people at the same level that you can in your one-on-one. -on -one. So you have to, you have to kind of think about that kind of tiered structure and, and then work from there. So that's what I think about when I think about that. Now, Todd, you already, yeah, that's a great lead in. Thanks. Um, I, you already spoke to part of the next slide. So, uh, we'll just move on, but I think you're absolutely right. Actually, it's very overwhelming. Uh, when you think about 3000 connections, um, cause I like to have a small group of folks that, you know, I know that know me. So when I think about early in my day, I was told to just connect with people and network with people. And my wife would say, I'm a, I'm a really good networker. But, you know, when I, when I thought about it, as I built out the LinkedIn profile, it became o overwhelming because, you know, there's an app, there's a, an approach of, do you connect with everybody or do you just connect with people that you know and that you have a specific tie to, that connection point? Um, and uh, early on, I, I wouldn't connect with everybody. I was very selective of who I connected with and it, there had to be meaning there. Either the meaning was I could help them or it was, you know, they would help me. But in a way, it was a two-way street that I could, we could help each other. And just by adding a ton of connections, you can't do that. So obviously, uh, Todd just mentioned, Todd just mentioned Jesus. And, uh, you know, I, you know, when we think about Jesus uh, and what Jesus did and how he came here, Todd was absolutely right. right? We are uh, basically, Jesus is connected to everybody. Um, so we're, you know, and the best thing about our, you know, who we are from a Christian faith perspective is we have a first degree connection. We have a first degree line right to Jesus. That's powerful, right? And we have not only just one, we have three. We have, you know, God, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they all play different parts of how we can connect with them. I love the Romans 12, 4, 5 here. It says, for as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. I love that. So I highlighted it in red because, right, isn't that, it's so important as we think about connections, as we think about our network, are we filling our network out with the same people? And if we take that concept and we put it into the human body, when we look at that picture on the left, actually, if you really dig into that picture, that human body is filled with what? They're all people. Those are all little people connecting to make that, that man on the left. And if we had all the same people, they did all the same thing, would, could, we, could we fulfill our daily tasks? I don't think so. It says, so we, so I'll finish on uh, verse five. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and in, individually, members of one another. And I thought that also kind of spoke to, it kind of talks about what do we do for each other, right? We have these members that do not have all the same function, but we have these individual or individually members, one of another, right? So all these members are one, or one of another. They're connected, they're to help each other, fulfill their, their, their you know, their task to fulfill their mission in life, to fulfill their calling as Todd has presented on. What are these individual members? And when we think about it making us up as a human, we think about it from a broader perspective in the globe. How are the people in the world that we're going to connect to gonna help us or how are we gonna help them advance? And most importantly, thinking about that first degree, Jesus, the why are we doing it? Why are we connecting with folks? What is our purpose? 
And how are we going to serve that person that we're going to connect with from a Jesus perspective? You know, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul in Romans, he obviously was writing uh, Romans or in part of Romans, he uses this concept of the human body to teach how Christians should like and work together under the authority and command of Jesus Christ. Other verses that you can reference that talk about kind of the unity in the body or connections is 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 31 and Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Those are also reference, you know, um, verses in the Bible you can reference to talk about unity and connections. So we talked a little bit about what are the connections and what is a connection. Now let's talk about building the list. I think this is an important, uh, you know, I think, I know early on I struggled with this. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm on an island there, but building the list is so critical. I, you know, we think about how do you build a list? And the first thing I went to when I was, building this out was where's Waldo? Does anybody know where's Waldo? Has anybody read the books? Was Waldo, Waldo always hard to find? I know for me he was. Have you ever felt like searching for a connection or the right connection is like finding Waldo? Indeed, indeed. You know, I, 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 you know, I think when, when you think about searching for that one connection, maybe that one job, the one right career, right? I think we all have different careers, but is it the career for me? Go back to the calling, you know, that Todd's done that we talk about. Have you ever thought like, I just cannot find it. All I need is one person that can help me get there. Where's, where's that one person in here? So I do, I do uh, coaching on the side with a bunch of uh, Christian men. I've done that for many years. Uh, Todd and I have come together to create FCN and um, my heart has always been in career coaching. I was part of uh, Saddleback Church Ministry in California, and they had a career coaching ministry I was part of early on. And one of the, one of the tools that we've, we've created over the years with the help of some others is this, is this spreadsheet. Who Currently, I'd love to, to hear, do you, as you're building out your connections or your network, do you manage that in a spreadsheet? Maybe by show of hands, who manages it in a spreadsheet? I've tried Anybody? to do that. I've tried what? to do that before. I've tried to do that before, but yeah. Does anybody, similar. does anybody use other tools? Like what tools do you use to other than LinkedIn? What tools do you use to, to manage your network and your connections? Yeah. Yeah. You know. We're working on recruitment. I'm sure you're familiar. We've got CRM, so like Salesforce or Bullhorn or whatever the case may be, you know, at a, at a particular employer. So that's usually, you know, how we how I try to keep track. Yeah. Um, for for anybody, um, I, I see George taking a picture. Um, I'll get a copy of this out so you can have just the template. It's not proprietary. I just put it together. I've got something a little bit more detailed than this than I use, but this is kind of a good, simple thing to start. Um, I love what, uh, I love, um, um, the, the CRMs I've actually, I signed up for Zoho recruit. Uh, it's a, it was this before it came out before it was big, uh, or became big. It was free. I used that for a little while to measure my CRM because it, it created an opportunity from an engagement perspective, but Consistently, LinkedIn is the go-to. I think LinkedIn has monopolized the, you know, the, the networking 
the professional networking corner and market. But I still like a good old fashioned spreadsheet. Um, LinkedIn, you still can export your connections from LinkedIn. It's just harder. There's actually, uh, you have to go through a few steps to get it. But I'll tell you, I've used a spreadsheet with contacts uh, in the past. I've either ha helped people find jobs by them. I've actually helped myself find jobs by them. Or it's, uh, it's helped me just keep in touch with people. Now we have Facebook and LinkedIn that helps us keep track of birthdays and other things if people put that stuff in. So I like to keep a spreadsheet because not everybody posts all their personal information. So what's on this spreadsheet? It's first last name, it's title of the person, it's the company they currently work at or maybe a company they've worked at previously, their phone number, their email, I have a column that says where I met them. The type of contact they are. Is it a professional networking contact? Is it a hiring leader? Is it a, is it a recruiter? Is it a colleague? For me, is it a candidate that I've met that I just haven't been able to place or find a job for? A person? I think the type column is very important. The date we connected, the purpose and the reason why we connected, and then I have a column for next steps. What's the next step as well as the date of the next step. And then my final two columns on this is email sent and letter sent. By show of hands, who still sends a physical letter to people that they've connected with or met with? It's a lost art. It's a lost art. But I'll tell you, I'm going over to my, my little, uh, my desk over here. I always have a few. So this is a card that I got, a handwritten card. Sorry, I don't have a picture of it. But this is a handwritten card I received from somebody I helped with job placement. And then these are cards I, I write depending on who I connect with. I don't, it's not 100%, but in certain cases, I'll send a handwritten card. And I'll take it even a step further. I love these. This is a, um, a water, water painting uh, drawing that somebody um, creates and they actually have a magnet in it. And, I'll, and these are like three or $4. I'll buy a bunch of these and then I'll just, I'll just write a little note in and I'll send them to people. Um, and I work at Whole Foods. They are, these are framed. There's a bunch of these framed on the wall. So just, you know, something that just tells that connection that they were important to me, right? It makes, it makes them feel good, right? So I, I would recommend a spreadsheet or something to keep track of it. What's not on here is birth date, anniversary at the company. If they give me their anniversary of when, you know, if they're married, kids, do they have kids? How many, what names? I like to put all that information in here so that when I want to reach out, I can reference something. It makes it more personable. So what do I have? The top 25 and then parentheses at 100. So the top 25, the, I would challenge everybody to start the list small. You can get overwhelmed with trying to put all your connections in a spreadsheet. So I would say pick top, your top 25 people that you've either connected with, that have influenced your life or something. Start building out that spreadsheet and then slowly, as you can, build it up to at least 100. And then that's the sheet you should go back to on a regular basis. All right, so interaction time. What, where is the weirdest place you've made a connection? I wanna hear from everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I met a candidate um, 
who I went on to, to help find a, a position and he's been a contractor for me for a few years now. Um, he pulled over to help me change the, the tire on my motorcycle. Um, it was throwing it down with rain, coming on for like midnight. You know, I, I just bought the bike. I had no idea what I was doing. And he, he pulled over and, and, and spent, like, you know, we, we tried for about an hour and then we gave up and he, you know, helped me get a tow truck. But uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty special. That's super cool. Thank you for sharing that, Matthew. That's awesome. I think for me, the, the, the weirdest one that happened years ago, and it, it's all past, but uh, I was staying at a hotel that had a, you fix your own drink happy hour. And I met this guy down at the happy hour. We wound up going out to eat uh, through him over the next three years. I wound up, this one was in the printing business. I wound up controlling all the business for him for every title company in the state of Texas, except one. Holy cow. That was a fix your drink. Hey, hey George, can I just, I, I, I got to throw this at you. What, what was the kick kickoff? Like what was the one thing you said or what initiated the conversation? Well, I mean, you know, it, I had a client in, I, I was living in Austin at the time. I had a client in college station. I went down, I spent two days a week in college station and, I stayed at this little hotel that, you know, they had, they had rolled out a cart, had a couple of bottles of wine and some beer and coach and you do it. He and I just got to talking and the thing. And it's like, well, Hey, we got to go eat. Let's walk to Luby's across the street. And he was in the title company business in Austin. And when he said, you know, why don't you, uh, give me a call and see if you can do some business. And a couple of weeks later, I, we, we met and, he had this one form he did and I did this one form for like two years and I kept saying, do you have anything else? And he said, no. And one day I walked in his office and the whole desk was covered with all these snap out forms because he was thinking continuous computer forms. And he says, can you do this? And I said, I've been asking you for two years, what else you had, you know? <laughs> and um, they had been buying them from some lady out in Amarillo or someplace and she would print them. And if an agency would call up and won't, two of this endorsement and two of that, she would put them in an envelope and mail them. And I said, well, you know, I won't do that, but I'll, yeah. I'll print them and package them in 25s and we'll send them out that way. Yeah. And he said, great. And then awesome. pretty soon that company got sold and the president went great. to Alamo Tile in San Antonio. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call. Can you come set the same thing up here? Another one went to a company in Dallas. Yeah. One, you know, and, and basically within about three or four years, except for Stuart title, I was doing every title company in the state of Texas. That's crazy. That's a great that, story. that conversation. That's a great story, George. That's a great story. I appreciate it. All right, everybody else. So, uh, I know we won't, I don't go, we won't go into great story. I don't know if anybody can top that, but it, just, uh, what is the weirdest place you've, uh, or, or what place did you meet the person that had the biggest uh, impact? Either you impacted their lives or they impacted yours from a connection or a network perspective. David, anything? I don't know. I think about that one. I, I try to stay out of weird places, but. Uh... I almost used the word interesting is almost okay. weird, but I thought we're in Austin, so let's just keep it weird. Yeah, probably uh, back in my younger younger drinking days, I'm sure there's some stories, but I don't know. I have to, that's a that's a good have point. To ponder that one. Yeah. What about you, Walter? No. All right, Walter must be on mute or something. What about you, Todd? I don't know that I've got a really good, you know, <clears throat> uh, interesting business story like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've had, you know, lots of different things. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I, I tend to have things happen somewhat more intentional. Um, but, you know, there, there's often interesting things inside the connections themselves. I mean, Cheryl and I, uh, I mean, the way that we are connected is actually pretty interesting. Um, and all the things we ended up having in common and things that have come from that. Um, you know, uh, probably one of the weirdest stories just like that. Uh, you know, my dad told me my, I was born and put author. 
<clears throat> and the guy that uh, delivered me, um, at some point in time, uh, my dad was telling me that uh, there used to be this little furniture resale store out here off of uh, close to Wells Branch. And uh, he goes, oh, the, the guy that runs that is the son of the guy that delivered you. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I went in there a couple times, met him and stuff. And, but we were involved with Boy Scouting at the time, too. And one time my uh, wife dropped me off because she needed the car uh, to this Boy Scout meeting at some other people's house. And I was having this friend of mine uh, bring me back. Well, we had, we had done this thing for our wives and, um, he had in introduced us to this other couple, this wife and husband that we had not met that ended up coming to this event we did for our wives because somebody backed out at the last minute. And so this wife came and, and, um, and so he's bringing me back and we passed by that place and he goes, Oh, Dan and Kathy are, um, are, are basically buying that place. They're going to run that. And I was like, really? I said, the, guy that ran that was this guy that, you know, was the son of this, this guy that, um, delivered me in Port Arthur. And he goes, Oh yeah, that's her brother. <laughs> so like, you can't make that kind of stuff up. Right. And, uh, no, no. so anyway, so just, just, uh, strange things, how, how God brings connections and stuff like that. I, I love what you just said, Todd. Uh, uh, God brings connections. We know that this isn't on our doing, right? We know that we, we, we can take, take onus of it. We can say that it was our doing, you know, but ultimately, if you have Jesus in your heart, and again, I'm not going to go on a soapbox more about connection, but if you truly pray about it and you, you, you are invested, um, he's going to open the door and he's going to put you somewhere where initially – like, like Matthew's story, you know, uh, and late at night, right? That angel that came by and helped him out, you know, ends up being somebody that he works with and, and has had a relationship for three or four years. So there's always an interesting spin on it. So why did I choose the gas station? Why did I choose a gas station uh, picture here? I couldn't find the one of me, and I don't think I did because we didn't have selfies and cell phones back then. But in 1991, I had just moved to Concord, New Hampshire, from a small town called, I, I grew up in a small town called Guilford, New Hampshire. It was probably, I don't know, um, 10, 12,000 people in the winter or less. And it was probably almost like 60 or 70,000 people in the summer because it was a um, vacation, vacation place. But Concord is the capital, state capital of New Hampshire. Um, and one year after I graduated high school, I decided I, was, I knew it all. I was dating a girl. And I could just leave my house because my parents weren't telling, you know, it was time for me. I, I, I could own it. So I basically, it was three years after the banking crisis of 1988, if anybody remembers that. Um, there's really, I had no, no college education, didn't really have any money. I quit my job at the restaurant job and I worked, I moved down to, to Concord with this girl. It was the first time I left home, no friends. Um, I, and I would really just take any work. So and I may have mentioned this before, but I was doing the traditional back in 1991. The traditional way of searching was newspaper, mailing resumes, walking into places, completing handwritten applications inside the, the places. And that was really it. There wasn't much. Uh, I mean, there was probably some online stuff, but I wasn't doing a ton of online stuff. Um, I was going into deli counters. I was looking for customer service line work. Uh, I was looking for restaurant. I, I had been a, uh, I had been a uh, lifeguard for a summer while in, in college or in high school. So just anything. So here I am pumping gas uh, in Ke Concord, New Hampshire, and I know nobody. And uh, this guy pulls up across from me and he gets out and you know, he's a bit older than I am. And he looks like, I forget what he's wearing, but he had nice shoes on and nice pair of slacks. And I'm like, all right, he pumps gas. And it's just the two of us in this random gas station. And I just, I was very shy back then. I didn't, I didn't talk to people or I didn't, uh, if I talked to people, I just threw up on them. Um, Cause I just kind of kept talking. So I just looked at him and I said, Hey, Hey, how are you doing today? And he said the same thing back. And I said, great. Um, I said, what, uh, what, what brought you, you know, obviously what brought you to the gas station? But I asked him the, the, the main question was, what do you do? You know, what do you do down here? 
And he, he said that uh, he was a manager of a restaurant. So what do you think he asked me back? Why am I here? Which then posed the, I just told him my story. I was very honest, right? And kid just moved to town, was looking for a job. I was having no luck at all. And he turned out to be the GM of a, of a local restaurant and he had an open, open server position. So he says, why don't you, he says, you seem like a nice guy. Why don't you, uh, boy, did I fool him. Um, but he said, why don't you come in for an interview? Come meet me tomorrow at three o'clock. And I did. I think I worked there. Uh, I think I worked there for, this is a picture of the restaurant. I think it's the old, old picture because they upgraded it. They changed it. It's called the grist mill. Um, and I worked there for, I think, two, two and a half years before I went to college. It was a great, it was a great role. I, I learned a lot. I became one of the head servers at the, uh, at the restaurant, made some good money. And, and uh, you know, because I opened my mouth while I was at a gas station. It's a good, good connection. Then here's a timeline. And I'm not going to go through every single detail, but the reason I put this together and I highlighted the names is I wanted to walk through the connections that you make in your life and how they impact you throughout your, your life and your career. Um, so never take a, you know, don't take a connection for granted because you never know where they're going to come into play in your life. So in 2001, I moved to California from New Hampshire, again, without a job, but with a girl. I have a habit of moving places with girls and then uh, those girls, I just, they, they go away. So here I'm in California, I don't have a job. I don't really have a career. I do have a college degree. I'm not using it. And uh, I go in and look for temporary work. One company puts me to work and then I continue to go and uh, meet with other temporary agencies or staffing agencies. And while I meet with one of them, this girl, Jamie, uh, was interviewing me and she said, hang, hang on right here. I want, I want to introduce you to somebody. And she brought her manager in and uh, that started my career at Robert Half. And uh, I spent about six years at Robert Half as a recruiter. And during that time in the, in the location I was working in, I, one of my colleagues that worked in the, the office just north of me, the next town up, his name was Suan. So why is Suan important? I'll tell you more about that later. So then in 2002, as I'm building my, my book of business, um, I call on this guy, I cold call this guy by the name Ken. And he, he just, he says, sure, come on in. He worked for a medical record company he did collections calls. He was actually leading the collections department. So I went in and met with him. George, kind of what you were talking about, you made a connection with that, that person. I walked in the office, I looked around his office and he had a Green Bay Packer helmet. So I asked him about it and I told him I was a New England Patriots fan. I couldn't tell whether he was gonna kick me out of the office or if we were gonna have good dialogue. But he ended up, allowing me to continue the conversation. And uh, I did a lot of business with him as a client. So then in 2004, uh, I played soccer with this guy named Paul Holt. Uh, was, this guy just shows up on a soccer field. I'm playing soccer with him. I'm in the recruiting business. I ask him what he does. And he's the CFO of a company, right? I was like, CFOs don't come and play soccer. So Paul gave me business. And then I met this guy, John, and this girl, Debbie, in 2006. John and I worked together at the church. And uh, John, at the time I was working for Robert Half, made an introduction for me to this girl named Debbie. I worked for Debbie for four years. At 2008, there was a big uh, housing crisis. And the, uh, um, the company I worked for was a small company. They had to, uh, they sunsetted, they stopped working. Well, I was still in touch with Jamie and Jamie had a, Jamie had a need and she hired me. 
So I'm not going to go through everything um, quickly here, but 2010, another person I connected, we had connected on another networking organization. And in that, I helped her find a job. She helped me find a job. In 2011, uh, Paul, who I had met before, and Ken, um, both I went to work for. I actually went to work for Paul and I hired Ken. And then in 2012, I decided to, uh, on a prayer, move to Texas. And it was only because of my relationship with Suan. Uh, I had talked about leaving California. Suan said he had an opportunity in Texas and then Suan hired me. And then I, I ended up hiring a guy by the name of Brett, who's in green. And uh, this other gentleman by the name of Will, he was a candidate of mine for one of the companies I worked for. I was helping him find a job. So I hired Brett, I met Will, and then Will turned, turned around in 2013 and made an introduction to me to a guy that, that ended up hiring me to lead the recruiting for his company. And then I met in that, I met a girl by the name of Linda. In 2013, I ended up hiring Brett again. And in 2014, Linda actually ended up hiring me at another company. And anyway, fast forward, sorry about the long, the long wind on that. But as you can see, through this whole period, there's multiple people that have come along that either I have helped find jobs or they have helped me. I don't think other than one job change in my career, it was me searching for a job. Every job change or career change I've had was due to a connection that I had made previously and I had stayed in touch with them. And then in 2019, I hired Brett twice. Brett was working at Whole Foods as a contractor. He called me out of the blue and he says, Kevin, I got the perfect thing for you. It's exactly what is gonna fit you as a person. You should come down and check it out. And I'm currently still with Whole, uh, Whole Foods. So I say all of that just to really focus on when you build your list, be very intentional and targeted in building your list. So then once you build your list, how do you harness the power? What do you do with it? So there's first, the first thing when you're building your list is to get to know folks. Now, this may not be the, the first question you, you should ask folks when you meet them, but if you're going to a networking event, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, if you're going to a networking event or you're in some sort of social event where it's focused around people getting to know each other, this is a very powerful question to ask folks. The question of what you do, what do you do, allows you to know Either how can you help them and are you going to be able to help them or how they may be able to help you. I think everybody on this call might be thinking about a job change and a job change, et cetera. So every person you connect with, I think it's in LinkedIn is very good because it, it helps you to understand what people do. But outside of LinkedIn, this question is a very powerful question that will help you get to uh, connections that will help you. Remember, people love to talk about themselves, who they are, what they do, and many of them are going to share not just what they do, but they're going to continue to share more information about their role and their company, and all of that information will help you determine if, if they can help you. But it's not just about them helping you, it is about how can you help them. Right? The best receivers are givers. If we give unintentionally, God blesses us. Right? We're, that, it says that specifically in the Bible. But you first have to be a giver. So I always go into every, every situation with those two questions. What do you do? And how can I help you?
And then going back to uh, going back to networking and is a contact sport. What are some tangible things that you can take away and implement? Sean, Sean last week talked about writing content and he gave you a very specific plan about writing content on LinkedIn. And I think it was exceptional. But outside of LinkedIn, what can you do? What should you be doing? I think sometimes we all, or I know I've experienced this and in many of the candidates I've worked in in the recruiting industry share it. When we're sitting at home looking for a job, you know, we can get, we can get lazy. Just be frank. We don't work 40 hours a week looking for a job. But when we're working, we work more than 40 hours a week typically. So what are some tangible things that you can do? I thought this was a good, um, a good uh, approach. So Joe talks about you should be looking to do five meetings or encounters a day. And we're going to start from the bottom up. That may be very difficult today in a, in a, in a virtual world. So you have to be more intentional. How am I going to meet people? What are my encounters? And these aren't like business meetings. These are just encounters. Could be somebody, somebody connected with you or made a, made a comment on LinkedIn or made a comment on, on Facebook. That's an encounter. And the goal really is to have five encounters a day, but not just a, it doesn't mean anything. There should be some meaning behind that encounter. But if you do that, each day, the goal is to send out 10 emails or letters a day. Again, maybe not letters. Obviously, handwritten notes are good. Maybe you start sending some handwritten notes to folks. At least emails. You should be, of your list that you build or your network on LinkedIn, you should be highlighting at least 10 people a day that you're sending some sort of note to. And then the last is 15 phone calls. This is an interesting one because I think when Joe wrote the book, it was years ago, but I still think a lot of us get away from phone calls. We don't call people anymore. We send texts, we send emails, we send Facebook messages, we send LinkedIn requests. The phone has been, the phone is such a, a lost tool. The ability to leave a message, the ability to get somebody on the phone and have a conversation, it's powerful. So maybe not 15, but I would set a goal every week to talk to, you know, talk to, talk to a number of people, make it a daily goal. Maybe you start with three to five. You might not get many on the phone. You might have to leave messages, but somebody might pick up. Or what if somebody called you back? I know if somebody leaves me a message at my office versus sending me an email, I'm probably more likely to respond to them via phone than I am on email. At the end of the day, the goal is to make connections. The more people you touch, the more possible, the more the possibility of them to reach back for you to have a conversation, tell your story that would lead into another step in advancing you forward. And we know that right now, it's a very lonely place, right? COVID has caused loneliness, depression, isolation. We've talked about accountability in the past. I love what Todd said about having integrity and accountability for yourself. But one of my favorite movies is, is Top Gun. And I love, I love the Air Force. My brother-in-law is an Air Force pilot. They can't do their job without a wingman, right? Somebody that's watching their back, somebody that might be helping them along. So first is you got to have accountability to yourself. But second is having a wingman or somebody in your corner. Maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you had a bad call. Who is that person you would call and turn to? Who's going to lift you up? Who's going to dust you off when you fall down and help you move forward? And as for wingmans, there's many captains of industry that had wingman. People like Thomas Jefferson, Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, they all had confidence that they could trust as sounding boards, wingmen, if you say, <clears throat> to give you clarity on dreams, your passions, your successes, your money, 
and what should and what should be the most important aspect of your life your family you know of your connections you're building who are these people that you go to some of the things that you want to make sure you focus on in, in building a wingman or, or having your kind of accountability is be you know giving them permission to to keep you accountable you know when we go talk about the goals that we just shared or the tasks are you accountable are you comfortable being vulnerable with this person do they have the permission to ask what if never lie to them meet with them regularly and allow them to ask tough questions i love this from uh a former f-16 pilot uh, rob waldo he says i'm your wingman you can count on me integrity service and courage are at the core of all i do committed to excellence accountable for results and trustworthy mission ready and focused i am always prepared i will lend you my wings in the heat of the battle leader confident partner i will never leave you behind and i will let, never let you fly solo who is that person in your life or a couple of people So what are the, what, here are some additional bricks and mortars for building relationships. These are some of the concrete blocks that you should be focused on as you're building your connections. Books. Joe Sweeney in his book talks about buying a lot of books. He buys it, he would go into Barnes and Nobles or a bookstore, he would come out with a, a, a handful of books and his books were to give away. He would constantly just buy a book and give it away. One of the books he talks about is Half Times, about how decreasing, uh, I think it's decreasing stress in your life. But anyway, have you ever bought a book and given it to somebody? I know Todd is great about, you know, he reads a lot of books. He's always referencing books in the different orgs that I'm tied in with him. He's always referencing books and talks about folks should read certain books, etc. You provide that same information. Returning phone calls. How quickly do you return a phone call? I'll tell you, sometimes, it, sometimes they fall off my radar, but I try not to. Emails. Again, going back to, are you sending 10 emails or 10 letters a day? And not just are you sending them, what do they say? What type of content? Speaking of content, Sean talked a lot about content last week. Are you a good listener? And asking the right questions. I think a really important question is also tell me, right, especially right now, tell me, how are you really doing? In, in my business right now and in, in our recruiters that work for Whole Foods, we, we have really focused in on this, that when you're talking to somebody, are you asking, are you leading with that question? Are you asking them, how are they doing? You know, maybe everything's good, but if you ask them, that might give them an opportunity to be vulnerable. And just like George said earlier, he got the whole state of Texas because he had, he had a very casual conversation with somebody and he probably learned more about that person as a person than about the job. And the last piece is follow-up. Make sure that you have a follow-up plan. You know what your next steps are and you execute on your next steps. And if you do all these things, and you follow it, there's a lot of other things you can do with social media, et cetera. But you need to change the mentality from struggling for success to a quest for significance. And I think, I think following up, being a good listener and asking those good personal questions really help you be that person. So I know we only have uh, about uh, 20 minutes left. So I was going to go into the next uh, just call to action, but before I do that, does anybody have any questions?
I know I talked a lot. <clears throat> right. So what what I would what I would say we do if uh, from a group interaction perspective, just some things that I have out here is uh, kind of a call to action. What are the top five best connections or connectors in your life? Thought we could talk about these or who is the best connector in your life? What characteristics cause you to choose that person? And who will give you who who will you give or serve this week? This is Todd Boyam, and we hope you enjoyed this presentation of Fellowship Career Network. We meet every Monday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m., and we hope you'll join us soon. To register and receive the Zoom link in your email, simply go to fellowshipcareernetwork.com today.